with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Genesis 22, starting at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'll tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the word, the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he carried the fire and the knife. As soon as the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes my son Abraham replied, The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb, the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two, of you, the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He then bound his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. Abraham looked up there in a thicket. He saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain, the Lord will of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called, a, called to Abraham from heaven for a second time. And he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because you have obeyed me. This is the word of our Lord. We do thank you, God, for this day and again, this opportunity to worship you. And now, Lord, as we, as we enter into this tough text this morning, I pray that you would ready us, that you would steady our hearts, that you would open our eyes, our ears, our minds for exactly what you have for us today. For we pray as we always do. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Life was good. God was faithful. Sarah and I finally had the son we'd always wanted. The son that we were promised. Isaac. Isaac was the apple of his mother in my eye. He could do no wrong. You see, Isaac was a product of God's faithfulness. So we treated him like the gift that he was. And through him, God was going to continue this great nation. I remember it like it was yesterday. God said, Abram, look up at the heavens. Count the stars in the sky. He said, that's what your offspring will be. And now, through Isaac, through my son Isaac, this promise of God could finally come true. We could have descendants and then there was the day the day the Lord spoke to me and said Abraham take your only son Isaac and sacrifice him I was broken I gathered up a couple of servants 
Isaac and some supplies for the journey, and then we, we were off together. We got to the place where God told us to go, and I, I told the servants to stay where they were, and Isaac and I would go on up the mountain and worship the Lord together. Isaac carried the wood, we carried the fire, and we walked on just the two of us. As we were wa- walking, Isaac stopped and, and he said, Dad, we have the wood, we have the fire, but we, we don't have the offering. Where's the offering? And all I could say was, the Lord will provide. I grabbed him, I, I bound him up, I placed him on the wood, and as a, I was about to do the unthinkable, raising the knife to slay my one and only son, I heard a voice cry out to stop me. And, and just then I saw a ram, a perfect sacrifice. So we sacrificed the ram, and the voice called out to me again and said, Surely I'll bless you. I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and on the seashore. And he said, Because of my obedience, because I fear God, because of my trust, my offspring will be blessed and it will be a great nation. Passionate. This series that, that we're in is we're, is we're on our journey to the cross, as we're, as we're making this journey with Christ uh, to the cross, intentionally talking about these things that we need to get passionate about, that need to excite us and, and, and get us ready uh, for this encounter of, of Holy Week and, and the cross and Easter Sunday. We talked about a passionate encounter that we as God's people, as we come face to face with Jesus, as we encounter him and we have this moment with him, we have two choices. We can either remain the same or we can be open to be changed. That God always desires to move us and to shape us and to change us. But often we're a people that don't want to be changed. This passionate encounter with Christ has got to bring forth a change. We, we talked about passionate faithfulness, that we as God's people, as we give back to God, whether that's worship, uh, the giving of our tithes and offerings as the plate passes us, whatever that is in life, we have two options there as well. We can either just be givers or even maybe three options, not give, or we can be passionate about our faithfulness, joyful in realizing that as we give to God, we give to God's kingdom, we give for God's glory. We talked about passionate evangelism. That that we as a people need to get serious about understanding and realizing that God desires to do more in our community. That God's heart is broken for the lost. That God's desire is that everyone would come into a salvific relationship with his son Jesus. And that this great commission has called us to participate in this. That we go, that we are called to the other, that we are called to reach the other with the good message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we are to get passionate about this calling and the great commission. That we should be excited about reaching others. We talked about passionate faith, that we need to get excited about our faith. But we talked about the difference in faith last week of, of selfish faith, faith so I can get something out of it, faith with the sole purpose of reward, and submissive faith or sacrificial faith. Faith where we say, I am given over to you, Lord Jesus. Use me, do with me, in me, through me. Whatever you want. Church, I I know this as we are on the road to Easter Sunday morning. I'm excited. And my prayer is that you would get excited. We're talking in staff meetings and board meetings about taking that wall down Easter Sunday. It's going to be down. Whether you invite folks or not. It'll look really silly if you don't. So invite. You're wearing the lampshade if you don't for Easter Sunday. But church, we need to be getting excited about this. God, how can you use us to further your kingdom, to further your will and your way? We need to be excited, church. 
God is doing great things. And I just believe with everything in me that God desires to do absolutely more and more and more and more. If we could just get passionate. Our scripture today is confusing. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's scary. It's frightening to see this side of God. Because God is love. God is mercy. God is grace. God, God, God is forgiving. God is peaceful. That's the God that we want to spend time with. But if you're like me, it's, it's a little hard to, to stomach this side of God in the scripture this morning. A God that demands to be feared. One that would ask such a thing of his servant. Like in many passages, we can't start here. We've got to back up a little bit to fully understand what's going on in the passage this morning. So in chapter 12... Abraham is, is living in, a, in another land. He's living in Haran. And, and this area that we now know is, is Iraq. And, and so he's there. And God tells him, leave your family. Leave your homeland. Leave everything that you know. Leave all of your security. And travel to this land that I'm promising you. A thousand miles away. This land of, of Palestine. I want you to go all the way over here. And so Abraham, Abraham was to trust God. Abraham was just to listen to these promises and trust God and just make this journey, leaving everything that he knew and making his way where God had called him to be. This trust, leaving everything based on the promises. God promised Abraham three things. The first thing, God promised Abraham family. God says to Abraham, I, I am going to make your descendants great. I, I am going to, and this is part of this covenantal promise as, as God makes covenant with Abram. He says, I'm going to give you family. I'm going to make your descendants numerous. I'm going to make a, a great nation out of you. I'm going to multiply you. And Abraham steps back and he thinks, I'm too old. My wife Sarai is barren. There's no way. God, I, I trust you. I, I love you. I, I think you're, a, you're amazing. You, you're my God, but you're wrong in this one. God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. God promises Abraham the promised land. This, this land fell, flowing with milk and honey, this fertile land, this beautiful land, land much bigger and better than he could have ever imagined. Remember, walk back to where Abraham was. Abraham was secure and safe where he was. And God called him out of all that safety, out of all that security to trust him in his promises. The third thing that God promises Abraham, he promises him Emmanuel. He promises him that he will always be with him. He promises his presence day in and day out. He promises Abraham that he will always be his God. So Abraham believes these promises. Abraham trusts God in these promises especially when number one begins to come true and he has Isaac. And so you can see Abraham getting excited. Now I know these promises are true. Now I know that I can have descendants. My name can be carried on because of Isaac. God is so faithful. The one true God who Abraham was in covenant with bound to in covenant, promises his faithfulness in those three things. And that's what makes this story so hard. 
Because understand, God wasn't calling for Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son. Hear me now, this is, that's important, but God was calling for Abraham to sacrifice everything. Everything. All of the sacrifices hinged on this one moment. You see, right after this passage we read this morning, Sarah dies. And so in God saying, sacrifice your one and only son, what God is saying is sacrifice everything. You see, church, this is the end of the story. This is it if this continues and Abraham is not stopped. Isaac is Abraham's only chance to live out these promises of God. Only chance for this story to continue. God wasn't just saying, sacrifice your son. He was saying, surrender everything. Can we just be honest this morning? And say this is a tough story. This is, a, this is a tough side of God. This is a side of God that isn't easy. This is a side of God that theologians for, for centuries have read and tried to explain away. And, and, and several theologians will say, well, just hang on here. God really wasn't calling for a sacrifice here. Remember, as Abraham is going up the mountain, he tells the servants, well, we'll be back. And, and there's something being said there. And... Some of them will say when, when they're going up and Isaac asks the question, well, where's the sacrifice? Abraham is foretelling what's about to happen. God's going to provide something. And we try to reason away this story. And the truth is the story is just hard. The story is just hard for us to wrap our feeble minds around. I remember as a young father reading this story and Asking the question, what would I do? I tell you this morning that this passage is not about a mean God. This passage this morning is not about God being a mean kid with a magnifying glass, just being mean to some ants or something. You see, our focus as we read this passage often goes to these things. How could God do such a thing? How can God, who is love, ask of such a thing? Why would God test like that? Why would be this be part of God's plan? Or, or sometimes our mind easily goes to, what would I do? I think it's important to remember this morning that God detested child sacrifices. That is, scripture was very clear. Neighboring cities had child sacrifices. And scripture says uh, that God detested this. That God was never for child sacrifices. God didn't want child sacrifices. This passage is not about, nor has it ever been about, Isaac being sacrificed. I'm going to back up and say that again because this is important. This passage is not about nor has this passage ever been about Isaac being sacrificed. You see, that's where we go because that's where our mind goes. This passage is all about surrender and trust. Ben Larson in the book Believe and Belong tells how he helped people struggling with surrendering their lives to Jesus. He said, for many years, I worked in New York City and counseled at my office. Numerous people would come in with their, their, their being str they're struggling with this idea of giving their lives over, this yes or no decision. He said, often what I do is I have them come walk with me. 
We'd take a journey. We'd walk down to the RCA building on Fifth Avenue. He said in the entrance of that building was a gigantic statue of Atlas. A beautifully proportioned man who with his muscles straining is holding up the world. And he can barely stand under the pressure of the world. He said, now that's one way to live. And he said, we could go across the street. The other side of the street is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And he said, behind the altar there is this little shrine of the boy Jesus. He said, perhaps eight or nine years old. He said, with no effort, he's holding the world in one hand. And so Ben says, we can go through life with the weight of the world on our shoulders, carrying everything, straining, about to be flattened. Or we can give Jesus our world. We're not good at surrender. We're not good at trust. We're not good at letting go and letting God have everything, letting God be the God of our lives. It's not our way. It's not the culture that we live in. The way of our culture is covet. Get what you can. In this world, grow as much as you can. Get as much as you can. Gather as much as you can. Keep for yourself as much as you can. If you don't take care of you, who will? Only the strong survive, accumulate. One of the first things the angel says as he stops Abraham is, now I know that you fear God. Fearing God is not about being afraid of God. It's about realizing his awesomeness. I think of Isaiah as he's in the temple. This beautiful passage, Isaiah 6, 1 to 8. Isaiah was a holy man. Isaiah was righteous. One of the good guys. And he finds himself in the temple and all of a sudden he is surrounded with the presence of the Lord. And Isaiah, this holy man, stops and he says... I'm done. I'm, I'm ruined. I'm broken. I'm unclean. The people I live with is unclean. And here I am in the presence of this holy God. This was fear. Not because Isaac thought he was, Isaiah thought he was about to die. But this was fear because he respected this awesomeness. This power of God. This is what's happening here. Now we know that you fear God, his awesomeness, his power, the realization he is creator, he is sustainer of life. God is everything and nothing can come before him. This is Jesus' conversation with many that wanted to follow one comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, I'll follow you. I'm in. Sign me up. But first, my dad died. And I've got to go bury my father. So just hang on. Wait there. I'm coming. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Another time in scripture that it's just confusing, if you will. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'm ready to go with you. I'm in. Sign me up. Jesus says, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to even lay his head. In other words, this journey ain't easy. Another one says, Lord, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. I'm in. Sign me up. But first, I'm, I've got to say bye. Family's going to wonder where I am, what I'm doing. And Jesus says, no one who plows forward and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Understand in these passages, we get so off subject here because we think Jesus is saying family doesn't matter. Dead fathers don't matter. Jesus is absolutely not saying that. He is not unsympathetic here. And God was never focused on sacrificing Isaac. 
what these passages are saying is who or what comes first in your life. Who or what is on that throne? Who or what have you taken and placed on that throne? Oftentimes it's us. Hear me, church. God wants all of you. Not some of you. All of you. We see the average Christian today lives in this the straddling this line of one foot is in and the other foot is out. I'm going to live for Jesus as much as I can and then I'm going to live for me. And lives in this back and forth. And if we, if we were really honest, if, if we really took a self-inventory in our life Sometimes, sometimes in many of our days, God might not even make the list of what's most important in our days. Pull your feet back. I might step on some toes this morning. My job, my family, the kids, my hobbies my money, my, my me time, my favorite ball teams, Cedar Point, my toys, my, my friends, my sins, my addictions, my fears, my complacency, my codependency, my desire to have my way, my attitudes, my complaining, my gossip. Sometimes our days are so filled with so much that God doesn't even make the list of what's important in our day. John Wesley would meet with the Holy Club and, and they would ask each other questions. There's this big list of questions and and they would ask each other, and, and they were keeping each other accountable, and th this went on daily. Uh, my favorite, though, John would often ask this question. He, he would do like a self-inventory, and John Wesley would say, um, did I spend adequate time with God today? And then he would follow up with this. If not, pull your toes back. <laughs> If not, I made the least important thing I did today more important than God. Did I spend adequate time with God today? Did I focus on God? Was he my God? Was he on the throne? Did I take him and place him on the throne? Was he God, Lord, King of my life today? Or did he get drowned out by all these other things? Because if I didn't spend adequate time with God today, I made the least important thing I did today more important than God. I.e., I made tying my shoes today more important than God. Every, every time I read that statement, it rocks my world. Church, nothing, nothing, nothing can be more important than God. Nothing can take that seat. Nothing gets to sit on that throne. It belongs to God. We have to be surrendered to God. 
What's your Isaac? And I, I just I just want to leave that up there, Jen. I just want to I just want to leave that there till we close things up and turn the lights out. I, I want to, I want this to just stick in your mind today. I want this to stick in my mind today. What's your Isaac? What are those things that are so important to you? And it's not that they're bad things. But often we take those things and we place them up on that throne. And that's God's. What are the things in your life that are taking precedence? The things on your life that are so and most important. And does God often take a back seat? And if he does, church, we have got to get passionate about placing him on the throne of our lives. And it takes, and you've heard it a million times during the series, you'll hear it a million more. It takes surrender.